Hello, my name is Sonia McMahon Kumartin, bereavement educator at CMHA Windsor Essex. Welcome to the Bereavement Education Seminar. Our hope is that this seminar will provide you with some strategies and tools to help you as you endure the difficult journey of grief. Whether that is yourself or someone that you're supporting, we hope that this normalizes this experience. Grief is difficult. We talk about working through grief. We don't just get over it because we are missing someone whom had an incredibly large impact on our life and we on theirs. So I hope that you will find that the support and normalization offered in what is shared here is beneficial to you we know it just doesn't make it better, but we hope you recognize that you are not going crazy, but you are grieving. So our learning objectives for this seminar include the following. First of all, the importance of grief and mourning. Then we'll discuss common reactions to loss, which include five realms, emotional, physical, behavioral, social, and spiritual. Next, I'll review realistic expectations of grief and then some healthy coping strategies. Following that, we'll look at the difference between normal grief and clinical depression. And lastly, taking care of yourself as well as local resource options and a little bit more about what we offer in our program at CMHA. So first of all, the difference between grief and mourning. We know that grief is a very intense emotional reaction to death. And the internal feelings that we experience, that's actually what grief is. It consists of feelings, thoughts, and images. We so often use the terms grieving and mourning synonymously, but actually they mean different things. As just mentioned, grief is our internal feelings, whereas mourning is our outward expression. When we talk about our loss, when we express emotion such as crying and asking those questions of why, perhaps expressing frustration or even anger. Mourning essentially, as Dr. Alan Wolfelt states, is grief gone public. We must mourn in order to heal. Keeping everything inside is not effective. It has been found over and over again to do the difficult work that is needed after experiencing a major loss. So again, grief is how we feel inside. Mourning is our outward expression. And just also to note, the word bereavement, you've perhaps never thought about what that means. We use it, but to define that, the word bereavement means to be torn apart and to have special needs. So yes, you might be thinking, my goodness, that's exactly what I'm experiencing right now. I'm just torn and feel very empty. And yes, we do. And the nature of the relationship we had with the person how often we saw them or interacted in some way um, on a regular basis, right? Our relationship with that person and our um, mutual sharing and, and how much we interacted, that makes a huge difference on our grief. When we were very close, our grief is largely intensified. So as I mentioned, grief impacts us um, in what we consider to be five different realms. We tend to think of grief impacting us emotionally, but as you'll see here, it impacts us in a variety of ways. So emotional, physical, behavioral, or also um, we, we phrase that as cognitive, socially and spiritually. So let's look first of all at the emotional realm. So see, emotional reactions to grief, we know that it's very common to experience shock, numbness, and denial initially. 
whether it was a sudden death, then we would naturally experience these types of feelings. But even with expected death, there may be some shock and numbness once it actually occurs. For people who were very ill and did no longer have quality of life, there may be some relief experienced. And there may be that feeling of relief and some, yes, as difficult as this is, I know it needed to happen. Anger is not uncommon when we're grieving. Those questions of why did this need to turn out that way? Why can't I have him or her here for a much longer time? The, you know, anger of the what ifs and the if onlys also. There could be a large amount of fear, maybe some anxiety and panic that comes along with the death, perhaps due to the absence of your loved one in your day-to-day -day life. Perhaps if it's someone that you lived with, that could be heightened as well. There may be guilt experienced. And with death, I think it comes down to, because of the finality, the guilt creeps in because there's no going back. Things that we wish we would have done or would have said that we cannot. And in a day-to-day -day situation when there's you know something that is said or or isn't and someone is still living we can go back and apologize or make amends in death we know there isn't that opportunity what i also want to stress though is guilt tends to weigh so heavily on us but oftentimes we did do everything we could. We did so much. We probably said many heartfelt things, even though in our mind, we wish we would have said more. So I'd like you to focus on what you did do rather than what you didn't do. Because again, we can create such turmoil and hardship on ourselves when we continue to go to the thoughts of what I didn't do. Depression may be experienced, those um, feelings of, you know, in, intense um, loss and, and just feeling so down and the emptiness and despair that very likely will come because we grieve because we have loved. So when we have loved and lost, certainly we are shaken to our core and that causes us to feel depressed and sad. Also, there very likely will be crying, perhaps screaming and wailing as emotional reactions in response to our loss. I'd like you to think about the person that you're perhaps watching this in honor of, the difference that they made in your life and you in theirs. And yes, they were so special to you, someone that you treasured, and you'll always treasure that person. So really, as much as it's painful and so difficult, wouldn't we find that it's odd if we didn't have that emotion? So if you can give yourself permission to feel that pain inside as well as express it outwardly, do that work of mourning in honor of your loved one. Remember, it's not about getting over loss. It's about working through. And if it's helpful for you right now, not only envision them, but say their name, either silently to yourself or out loud. We don't always have or take that opportunity. But it is so important and helpful to honor our loved one. Next, we'll look at physical reactions that we have. This isn't as commonly thought about as the emotional reactions. But if you have experienced or may experience some of these reactions, know again that they are not uncommon. There could be tightness in your throat and chest. 
Your breathing may be very short and it might be harder to catch your breath. You may hear someone say, it's important to just breathe. And that is so true, taking large breaths in and out just to try to relax yourself. You may feel lack of energy, just so tired, perhaps exhausted most, or you might even feel that all of the time. It could be really tough to sleep, which makes it more difficult too, but whenever you can rest and or sleep, do so. We know that when we're grieving, getting maybe four hours of sleep might be lots. Frustrating, yes, but the reality of what we experience often with grief. It's an individual choice. You may, you know, decide to take something to help that. Some people find melatonin is beneficial. Others speak to their doctor about a sleep aid. Doing what works for you. Other ideas include meditation or mindfulness exercises. You may decide to use an app or website, for example, Headspace, Calm, and Breathe. There are just three that I'll, I'll name um, as examples of helpful meditation and mindfulness exercises that you can engage in. There might be other music selections that help you just to relax. As much as we don't recommend and studies have shown that screen time isn't effective in helping you go to sleep, some people do need to fall asleep with a little bit of noise and turn the TV on. So again, recognizing what is helpful for you. There might be brain exercises that you do as well that are helpful. Thinking of a time or a place that is very relaxing and helps you to just be in the moment and focus your thoughts on that. Another idea when I mention brain exercises, some people find it tremendously helpful to think of all the words they can that start with A, then go on to B, Furthermore, do the same C, D, and oftentimes by the time you're maybe at just four or five letters at D or E, you recognize when you wake up that that did help you to fall asleep. Again, because you were focused on something else. Giving your mind a break from the heaviness of what you've been carrying. You may notice a loss of appetite and it's very difficult to eat because you just don't ever feel hungry or, you know, food's just not appealing. Small meals, just trying to keep it, uh, you know, healthy to keep, give you some energy and strength um, would be what's, what would be suggested for that. And having some food prepared already, that can be beneficial. So you're not just grabbing junk food out of the cupboard. On a day when you're feeling like a little bit more energetic, perhaps you can cut up some veggies or fruit and leave a supply in your fridge for a couple of days. So when you are hungry, you'll just grab that. High protein snacks like um, almonds or pecans, yogurts, things like that are also helpful to give you some strength and energy. You may find that you're finding comfort in eating. So for you, it may be about increased appetite. So that's something to also be very mindful of and trying to regulate that and find balance. Headaches and stomach aches are not uncommon in grief, as well as chest pains. So keeping in mind what is normal for you recognizing perhaps when it has become excessive and you need to seek medical attention. Um, knowing your body and listening to your body is most beneficial. So let's move on to behavioral or cognitive reactions. It's not uncommon to feel disoriented, forgetful, 
have a terrible time concentrating. So often hear the bereaved say, I feel like I'm in such a fog, or it's like a blizzard and I just can't see anything. Concentration is impacted greatly. I know, you know, I put my keys in my purse. I was sure I did, but I can't find them. Know that it's normal. Know that it's difficult to focus on things like reading, even if you were an avid reader before. Be very patient with yourself and try to have a system that works as well. Making a list and always putting that list in the same place, for example. That's beneficial. Always hanging your keys where they belong. Knowing that even if you were an avid reader before, perhaps just reading one page at a time will be all that you can do now. You may have very little motivation and lack initiative to do things that were just second nature before. Again, I'd recommend being patient with yourself. Your house perhaps was always neat and tidy and now you just can't make that happen. Give yourself a break to know that you will get back to that, but right now you just are carrying so much that perhaps you can't do that. Asking others to help you, that is something that we often don't want to do, but is really recommended and helpful also. Recognizing that we're in a spot of deep despair. We may feel very helpless and hopeless. So we need someone to walk beside us and assist in what might be seemingly simple day-to-day -day chores. But right now they feel like so much. So again, allow yourself to ask. Normally friends and family are very honored and it even helps in their grief journey to benefit to assist you in your day-to-day -day tasks. You may be very preoccupied with thoughts of your loved one and the death circumstances, how things occurred, you know, maybe there were unexpected circumstances, or perhaps it was expected death, but you really are just having a tough time integrating that into your life journey. There may be lack of activity interest in activities that you once really loved to participate in. So again, giving yourself a break to do what you are able. Maybe when you try certain activities, even if it's only for a matter of minutes that you engage in them, be content with that for the time being. Restlessness and overactivity are also very common when we're grieving. Social reactions, this is another realm, the social aspect in, in our grief journey. We may withdraw from social relationships and routines. There may be some need to withdraw in order to assist us to just get through what has occurred. Remember, expecting ourselves to be involved in activities and commitments like we were before really isn't natural. Think of your loss as, you know, that you're carrying maybe 10 pound weights in each shoe. And so to be able to have the endurance that you once did to go about your day just isn't there. But it's potentially so that you feel very lonely, perhaps isolated in your grief. And you may have a tough time talking to others or asking for support. We'll talk more about that later, but it is very helpful to have a small safety net of some people who will listen and just be there for you. We don't want to expect ourselves to participate in everything as we always did before. Ideally, we also don't isolate ourselves from activities and people. Finding a healthy balance is most recommended. Spiritual reactions. 
your faith may be challenged in that you possibly are very angry at God or your higher power. And if you are, know that that is normal. We can tend to feel guilty when that occurs, but questioning our God or higher power can be something that is difficult for some people to not do because of this experience that has taken so much out of them and from their life. On the other hand, your faith may be strengthened or enhanced. Your faith may be stronger than what it was before. And you may find great comfort in your beliefs and that you draw on them to a large degree. All very individual. There may be questions of why me, why now, you know, why, why did this have to happen? And we know there's often not answers to those why questions. So being with them, living through those questions of why, knowing that that is part of your processing in this journey. You may also question the meaning of life without your loved one. And that's something that if you need to do that, recognizing that things are so different and there's that maybe you might call it a well that you feel that you're just going down as long as you recognize you're going to the depths of that pain but you are determined to climb back out that's what's very important if you're questioning the meaning of life and feeling that your life is not worth living, we want you to be very honest with yourself. There may be those fleeting thoughts, and that is normal, but if you feel that your own safety is at risk um, due to your own suicidal thoughts, you do need to seek help for that. So again, those were the five realms. And as we work through and live, you know, with the day-to-day -day adjustment, we need to be very realistic in what we expect of ourselves. So I mentioned as I went through the five realms that there are some things that we just want to do as we did before. But know that because there's such a multitude of thoughts and feelings that we're experiencing, we may not be able to. And grief is truly a painful experience to endure. Nonetheless, we need to feel our pain of grief in order to come to a place of healing. By that I mean we cannot avoid it, suppress it, we cannot try to, you know, do the keep busy all the time and not think about it. Yes, it's encouraged to step in and out of the pain and do things that take your mind off your grief at times, but we can't busy ourselves and preoccupy to the extent that we're not feeling our pain. So truly important. Our grief so often does hurt more before it hurts less. We don't have a time frame for grief we're all very individual and we don't we, we can't give a number of months or length of time for us to work through our grief but we do know that the normal shock and numbness that defense mechanism that the body has to help us through those early days of this reality and getting through a visitation, funeral, life, celebration of life. Our defense mechanisms of shock and numbness assist with that, and we often do experience some numbness for a few months. But as the reality continues to be with us day to day, and the length of time increases from when we've seen our loved one, we do know that our grief does start to hurt more 
before that pain softens or diminishes. We also know that grief is very unpredictable. It's not just a straight line and, you know, we can't say this is what you'll experience. For all of us, it's so different and you might think of it as, you know, a very um, messy line of events and days that you just aren't sure how they're going to unfold. I mentioned the word patience early, earlier and I mentioned the word support. So being patient with yourself as well as being open to the support of others are key. We do need others to help us. They can't do the work for us, but they can be there. So often in our society though, we tend to want to fix things and make things better. Know that it's not possible and there is no quick fix for grief, but allow others to journey beside you and let them know that you don't expect them to make things better for you, but be what I'll call a leader in your grief to ask them for what you need, to just listen, to maybe help you with small day-to-day -day tasks. If someone hasn't been there on this difficult journey, they may not know. So when someone asks you what you need, feel welcome to communicate that. And knowing that as much as it may seem impossible now, you will not always feel this bad. With time and hard work, the pain will soften. In saying that, though, I want to highlight that old adage of time heals. I need to say that it's not just time that heals, but it's what we do with that time. So engaging in stepping into our grief is so vital. So coping through grief. Our bodies do want to move towards healing. I've mentioned that we don't want to avoid, numb, or repress the pain, just thinking it'll go away. Because when we do just try to keep busy or turn to substances in order to feel okay, we know that that's a temporary fix. As is gambling, turning to food, excessive shopping or eating, all of those are just short-term lifting us up to feel better, but they certainly don't last. And for those of you who have had your partner die, I want to also caution you that entering a new relationship before you've truly done your grief work can actually cause a great deal of confusion for you and complicate things. Entering a new relationship at some point may be what you do, but doing that in the future after you've really done the hard work of grief. So let's look at some healthy coping strategies. And with these strategies, um, we're actually dividing them into the five realms of grief that we talked about earlier. We know that our bodies naturally do want to move toward healing, so we don't have to be resigned to this, um, you know, constant tension and pain. So developing healthy strategies to get through this really tough time in our life. So what might some examples be um, for each of the five realms? So first of all, the emotional realm, talking about your loved one, talking about the pain, yes, but also talking about them, laughing, treasuring memories shared, enjoyable and funny moments, keeping their memory alive within you and within your heart. That may cause some tears as well, certainly, but that is healthy grieving. Looking at photo albums or old movies. Again, putting you in touch with your feelings can be painful, but you're stepping into your grief. 
Same with any form of writing, journaling, writing letters, poetry, to or about your loved one. Something that I can't even stress enough is so beneficial. If you're not a writer, perhaps it isn't for you, but I would also encourage you to open your mind to the possibility of even writing a few words or sentences that resonate with you. Perhaps for you it's about being more artistic. There can be great expression in sewing, knitting, quilting, crocheting, and whether you're incorporating some of your loved one's belongings and what you're making or just doing that to express yourself, either is super therapeutic. Expressing yourself through music and whether you are able to sing or play an instrument because you've been trained or that's something that you just do for you, listening to music also, what a wonderful outlet. And art. Again, if you're artistic and have some ability or it might be drawing very simple things and there's so much meaning, whatever that might be, allowing that emotion out. And whether you share that with others or it's strictly for you, your choice. So those are some examples and I hope they prompt you to think of more whether some of these are what you decide to do or whether it's about, you know, some other things that, that you enjoy. But the main thing is that you have some form of expression. And we know physically that it's vital to be active, to help work through our emotions and that impacts the um, the movement inside our body, the um, levels of serotonin and endorphins and you know it speeds things up and, and helps us when we exercise, when we um, have a massage, do yoga, meditate. We also want to do the simple things as I mentioned earlier, like deep breathing just sitting with your eyes closed, breathing in deeply, and then releasing that. The value of that is something that we often tend to underestimate. Making healthy diet choices, that is another one that is just vital, as is drinking lots of water. We know regularly how important those things are when we're grieving and need to take extra care of our body and may become more dehydrated because of it, we need to make a point of that. And if you're not a person who naturally drinks water, maybe you'll put the strategy in place to, you know, have several water bottles that you have out. Fill up a certain number in the morning and strategically place them, you know, in your home, at work, wherever you will be, in a regular day in your car and to ensure that you will drink adequately. Sleeping also so important as I mentioned earlier it's not always something that comes easily but going to bed at the same time every night and having that regular routine that is helpful for your body as well. So let's look at the social realm now. Accepting invitations as well as saying no. I indicated earlier that that balance is so important and how you define that is really up to you. But having people around you who are very supportive, that is key. And just to highlight a little bit what I mean by that, I'm just going to uh, go over to another slide here. Okay, I guess I don't have that, sorry about that. Um, I'll explain what I wanted to uh, tell you about the support of people. So when we are grieving and any time in our life, we want to surround ourselves with people who will be present with us and be accepting of our emotion. And in summary, you might think of it as what we'll call the rule of thirds. And this is something that Dr. Alan Wolfelt, a well-known 
uh, author and educator in uh, the bereavement field, talks about. Approximately one-third of people are empathetic helpers. One-third of people will be neutral, and another third of people will not be helpful. They very likely in, won't intentionally be damaging to you, but they will perhaps try to fix what you're going through, take away that pain, maybe be somewhat judgmental. When you're with these people, you'll recognize that you just don't feel the same level of support. So it's actually most beneficial to seek out friends and family members who fall into that first group, those who are empathetic helpers and good listeners who will be there with you. And we call it joining you where you're at, not taking away the pain, not encouraging you to stop crying, but being present with you. So again, remember the rule of thirds. And those people who are neutral, that really don't say anything um, and, and offer much support, you know, they, just like the people who may seem a bit judgmental or want to take your pain away, might be the ones that you tend to, say, go to a movie with where there's less conversation. And those empathetic helpers perhaps are the ones that you decide to, you know, have an afternoon visit or, or dinner with. Reflection and, of course, laughter are also super beneficial and necessary as we're grieving. I so often hear, oh, I shouldn't laugh. You know, it's, it's, it's so hard to just be able to uh, experience enjoyment in my life. But yes, you have your life still to live and you know that your loved one would want you to still be happy, be able to enjoy moments and of course laughter. Now the cognitive or behavioral realm. I mentioned earlier, making lists, ask for and be accepting of help. Ask questions. Yes, you are not on top of your game as much as you used to be. You are forgetting things. You're not able to concentrate as you were before. So ask questions and if possible, keep things simple and recognize and not need to apologize for your limitations. One of the most difficult pieces, I think, is to be patient with ourselves and to give ourselves the gift of recognizing and just being with our limits. So if you can give yourself that gift, that is huge. So the fifth realm, spiritually. Some strategies in that realm. Perhaps it's about prayer, maybe meditation, you could do some work to explore your belief system, maybe more deeply than you ever have in the past, or reevaluating your views of the world and what life meaning is about for you and how you can enhance that. Perhaps you've gained new perspectives and insights. And even though this loss is something that you wouldn't have asked for, see what gifts there may be in the difference you make in other people's day-to-day -day life or they in yours. You might use grief rituals like lighting a special candle. You may, you know, have a ritual that you do as far as looking at your loved one's picture every morning and or night. Um, you may even talk to their picture, hug or kiss their picture. Nothing is abnormal or crazy about that. Please give yourself permission to do that. And lastly, making a gratitude list can be amazingly helpful to recognize and write down those things in our day-to-day -day life that we're thankful for. Those things that even though we're hurting to a large extent are so meaningful and we know that we still appreciate every day. For example, it may be something as simple, yet also it's, it's large, right? That you're recognizing the sun is shining today, or you know that you are um, recognizing the cloud formations and there could be something special about that. Maybe there's a view of 
water or, you know, something about the trees or birds. Who knows what it might be? You'll notice that commonly, and the examples I'm using seem to come from nature, but it might also be the smile that someone, you know, shared with you, and that just meant so much on this difficult day. So to embrace, recognize and embrace those things and capture, maybe just make a list you know, uh, write the date and every day two or three things on your gratitude list. And when you're struggling, reviewing that list, taking a look to see the important and special days, and special things that your days still consist of in spite of the difficulty that you're enduring and the pain that you're feeling. Okay, so this slide is entitled Good Grieving. Just to recap some that I've mentioned and uh, go over some new ones. You need to feel what you feel and not bury your feelings. Remember I mentioned that work of mourning, we need to express ourselves. Much more important than many realize. Grief is certainly not about being strong for others. Instead, it's about going where we need to, being with our emotions. As I said, giving ourselves the gift of grace to be present in moments, even when those moments cause us to, to feel like we're crumbling, but to experience those recognizing that is our grief journey. And when we talk about being strong for others, that includes children. When kids see us cry, that's actually very important that we model that that is acceptable and helpful. We don't need to hide that from someone at any age. I've already mentioned the value of talking, writing, drawing, painting, any, any way that you are creative and expressing yourself. And again, whether you share that with others or just keep it for you, it's a personal choice. Accepting the hurt of painful memories and also hopefully as you reflect on them, some can make you smile, and it may be laughter and tears at the same time. Parting with loved one's belongings. This one's really large. The concern that normally comes with this is people tend to give away belongings or part with them quickly. We want you to do this gradually and thoughtfully. Take your time. Not that you will keep everything, nor would that be what's encouraged, but the mistake that many people make is they think it will help them to get rid of some of the pain. It will help them to feel less bad when they get rid of some belongings. But then they regret that they did that and aren't able to get some of those things back. So think about what you'll keep, what will go to your loved ones, family and friends who are special to you and, and were to your loved one. And be very mindful of the meaning that has for all of you. And clothing, for example, it may not be that you'll wear your loved one's clothing, but there may be, you know, their favorite shirt or jacket that you'll always want to have hanging in the closet. That's okay. And something that is not abnormal to do. You may yourself make pillows, perhaps teddy bears, a quilt, um, teddy bear clothing or doll clothing out of your loved one's articles of clothing. There's table runners, some people make out of ties. There's a multitude of ideas that can be used. So consider whether or not that's something that you'd like to do. Making rest and self-care a priority Yes, even if you cannot sleep well, taking good care of yourself to make time to recognize the value of rejuvenating rest. Maintain friendships and be open to new ones. And friendships that perhaps are, you know, ones that you've had for a long time, those people might be right there. Other times we um, are more supported by those that we would least expect. Whatever it is for you, having an open mind and heart with that. 
and also recognize that coincidentally, perhaps at a support group, um, who knows, there may be new friendships that you cultivate and allowing yourself to be open to them. Having signs of life around you, plants, pets, people, all of that can be positive and life-giving. Avoiding major decisions for the first while, that's important too. We don't want to make decisions when we're not thinking clearly or decisions impulsively that we think will help take away the pain of grief. So give yourself some time. You want to face and resolve your faith issues rather than hide or turn a blind eye to them. I've mentioned several times already and can't stress enough the value of being patient with both yourself and also others. Make plans to acknowledge significant days. The anticipation of special dates, whether your loved one's birthday or the anniversary of their death, which some of you will choose to call anniversary, some call it angelversary, their memorial day, whatever language you use, as well as holidays, it's helpful to think about how you will acknowledge those significant days. It doesn't mean that you have to have something large or costly, but it might even mean choosing the candle that you're going to light or a special picture that you are going to have out or the park or river, you know, a place maybe that was their favorite that you're going to take a walk. It might be by yourself or invite others to do so. Whatever is meaningful for you, but thinking about ahead of time how you'll mark those significant days. Trust yourself and that you're where you're supposed to be, knowing that your emotions will be very up and down, knowing that it will feel like you're going backwards, perhaps more than forward. We do know that the grief journey is steps forward and steps back, a couple steps forward, maybe three back. But recognizing that this process is temporary and if you can take it moment by moment and day by day, you will make it through this journey. And I say that having endured some personal life losses as well as journeying with so many people. And, you know, I can reflect on where they were when they first came for support and the growth that they experience due to being committed to the hard work. So also, it's important to differentiate between normal grief and clinical depression, because some of you may be wondering, mm, gosh, is this, you know, what grief's all about, or should I be doing something about this? I really am wondering if I'm depressed. So a lot of these points come from um, Dr. Ellen Wolfelt's work, The Depression of Grief and Understanding Your Grief. And if this doesn't give you enough information between talking to um, whomever you might seek out for professional support as well as your doctor, um, you may want to read further about this. As I said, his one book, The Depression of Grief, is very much... Um, it helps to clarify what's normal and when you might be experiencing clinical depression. So with normal grief, we do tend to respond to support and comfort. We express our anger openly, relate depressed feelings to the death of our loved one. So, you know, it's not that we're angry at, uh, at, at the world, so to speak, right? We know that our depressed feelings are because of our loved one no longer being physically present with us. With normal grief, we still do experience moments of enjoyment, but we also have and can show feelings of emptiness and sadness. You may experience short, lived, and periodic physical co complaints. That would be a sign of normal grief, as would expressing guilt over a specific aspect of the death. 
there might also be a temporary loss of self-esteem. So differentiating this with clinical depression. When we're clinically depressed, we tend not to accept support. We're very irritable, complaining often, but do not directly express what our anger is at and about. We don't relate our feelings to a certain life event. In a, instead, we tend to demonstrate an all-around sense of doom and gloom and just nothing is right. With clinical depression, we project a sense of hopelessness and our emptiness is very persistent and ongoing. We tend to also have long-lasting physical complaints with clinical depression and feel a, quite a deep and ongoing loss of our self-esteem. So if you recognize some of these, these would be signs of potential clinical depression. And I encourage you to, to approach this and not avoid you know, this because there probably will be lots of benefit for therapy as well as conversation with your doctor. So very important things to remember. Grief, yes, it's a long process and changes as we journey. There's no end date to grief, but it does get easier. I mentioned earlier that we like to use the terminology that it softens. And talking about and encouraging you to discuss your loved one and speak their name. We don't want to pretend that they never existed. We know that they were such a special part of your life. And even though they're not physically present, they continue to be part of who you are. And we don't want that to end. So talk about them. Laugh and share fond memories and certainly speak their name. And at the bottom of the slide, you'll see some activities that you might engage in to remember your loved one. There are so many ideas, but there's just a few listed, like a special tree planting, maybe some form of memory book, watching movies or videos, and looking through albums making your loved one's favorite meal, having a toast in their honor, including children in that as well. By that, I mean it might be, you know, a favorite candy in a dish or a shot glass. Toast to whomever, right? Toast to dad, toast to grandma, whomever it is. Also, to keep what we call linking objects, Objects that to you mean a connection to them. Maybe there's a special stone, coin, piece of jewelry, you know, some clothing or a pin that reminds you of your loved one. Perhaps it was something of theirs. And depending on the object, it might be something that you keep in your pocket. If you're fearful to lose, that wouldn't be what we'd suggest. But keeping these objects, being able to look at them and touch them and savor the meaning of your special person. Also, um, that reminds me when I talk about objects, some families decide to collect, perhaps even paint things like rocks, something that they don't want to keep, but they um, have this activity to honor their loved one. And when traveling, they may decide to, you know, leave a rock in a special place. That may be a place that they visited with their loved one in the past. It may be a place that they know their loved one would have gone or even that their loved one intended to go to. So it's a way to bring that person there with you and, you know, enjoy those special thoughts um, in, in whatever way you choose. But again, thinking outside of the box, so to speak, to do any type of activity like that 
that is meaningful for you and your family. So I want to highlight, in addition to what I'm sharing here to help you feel supported and normalize your grief, we are in the process of developing here at CMHA another bereavement education seminar. It will be offered in the near future and it will include coping techniques, um, including things like grounding, meditation and mindfulness, as well as emotional regulation and including specific information on helping you deal with guilt and shame. So just wanting you to be aware and watch for that also. Some of you have perhaps already done an intake with us and you uh, that involves answering questions about yourself and your loss it takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes. But for anyone who's just watching and hasn't but feels you would benefit from further support, the CMHA Bereavement Resource Program can be um, accessed by calling our coordinated access number which you'll see here is 519-973-4435. Again, 519-973-4435. So if you feel professional support would be beneficial for you, by all means, please reach out and do an intake so you will be able to access support. And on that note, just letting you know a little bit further about our program and what we offer. For those of you with what is considered normative grief, you will attend the two education seminars, this one and the one I just mentioned. Then we have a partnership with Family Services Windsor-Essex for support for normative grief. So if you do if you would benefit from supportive counseling, it's short term, one to three sessions that are offered. And then you have the option to participate in a law specific group. Some of you will receive one on one prior to participating in a group. Others will go directly um, into group after attending these education seminars, depending on individual need. And those of you who are considered to have complex grief or trauma, you'll also attend the two group education seminars, and then you will be engaging in one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. And again, if you choose and it's deemed a suitable fit by yourself and your therapist, then you may also participate in a law-specific group. And at CMHA, all of our groups are loss specific. For example, we have spousal loss group, we have bereaved parents group, we will be having bereaved parents of infants group again soon, um, suicide loss survivors, we have um, what we call adult grievers when you've lost a family member, friend and or parent. So we find it's, it's helpful and people relate well when groups are law specific. So you will be streamed according to your need and we hope that any services that um, you engage in, you will find very helpful. Because we do know that grieving is as natural as crying when you're hurt, sleeping when you're tired, eating when you are hungry, or sneezing when your nose itches. It's nature's way of healing a broken heart. This quote by Doug Manning. And to follow that, Dr. Alan Wolfelt offers, the essence of finding meaning in the future is not to forget my past as I have been told, but instead to embrace my past. For it is in listening to the music of the past that I can sing in the present and dance into the future. And I found that the uh, logo for our Soul Focus project was appropriate for this, with the shoes representing, you know, the soul work that we do. And also, I mentioned earlier, it takes steps forward and steps back. And in the, the midst of that, the heart. So knowing 
that while you have lost, there are still other things in the world to be grateful for and to love and be loved. And lastly, for all of us to allow things to flow, because as much as right now it feels like a struggle, perhaps to do the day-to-day, maybe you're beyond that, but wherever you are in your journey, we know that every darkness is followed by a sunrise. So wherever you are at on this path, know that there is support, that there is hope. We certainly wish you well, and if you so choose, look forward to working with you through our bereavement program at CMHA. Thanks so much for joining this Bereavement Education Seminar. I do hope that you found it beneficial. And for now, we'll say goodbye, but potentially see you at some point in the future. Thank you so much. Take care.